Bienvenue. Welcome. Remember Blazing Saddles? Of course you do. Hi, Dave Lamont. Time for your Nooner with Dave Lamont on a warm and humid Central Florida Friday. That's where I am. Not hiding out from uh, the hurricane, but just doing some family stuff. But appreciate you joining me today. And every digit I have is crossed that we will connect with our guest a little in just a few minutes. But I do want to get to a few quick thoughts because there's definitely some things to talk about. First off, a breaking story. Just in the last hour or so, two more teams being forced to sit because of the coronavirus, and that would be the Brewers and the Cardinals. Apparently, there are some positive tests in the Cardinals clubhouse. So now six teams, Marlins, Phillies, the Nationals, Toronto, who were supposed to play the Nationals, and now Milwaukee and St. Louis are idle. That doesn't mean that everybody has positive tests. I haven't heard anything about Toronto. And I think Washington just had one. But the Marlins are a raging storm of COVID-19 right now as they try to figure out how they're going to be able to play next week. So, yes, it's pessimism around Major League Baseball right now. You've got teams that are clean. What happens to them? Do they get hosed out of the season? Can we figure out some way to salvage this? That's the biggest headache right now. I would ne You couldn't pay me to be in those MLB offices right now trying to come up with some sort of a solution for this. It's got to be absolutely brutal. In the meantime, the NHL comes back this weekend. They've had a great time so far in, as far as their exhibition games have gone well. The testing has gone well. I'll be curious to see what happens the first few games. I'm not so sure the NHL will be as socially woke as the NBA was last night and will be. Because if you are the type of person who wants the athletes to stick to sports, let me offer you some very friendly advice. Make sure your Netflix, Amazon Prime, Hulu, and whatever else you watch subscriptions are updated. Because it looks like the NBA is full steam ahead with social justice messages, whether you like them, whether you support them, or whether you don't. The NBA even overlooked its all teams must stand for the national anthem rule. Remember that came out in the wake of the Colin Kaepernick kneeing incident a few years ago? Well, now everybody, including the three officials who called that first game, and I believe everybody in the second game, which I didn't stay up for, and both games, by the way, turned out to be exciting, uh, both decided in the last 20 seconds. So some good basketball. But yes, this is how it's going to be. Players have social messages approved by the league, but still on their back. Donovan Mitchell, the Utah Jazz, wore a bulletproof vest at the postgame press conference. So if you don't like your athletes mingling social causes, whether you support those causes or you don't, this may not be for you right now. So you've been warned. If you just only want to watch sports, maybe you tune in when the game starts and right before it ends if you want to watch basketball. And as I mentioned, it was some pretty good basketball last night. The Utah New Orleans game had great runs by both sides. And who, how weird is it? Rudy Gobert, the guy who started us on this path. Rudy Gobert of the Utah Jazz, the guy who touched the microphones and tested positive first, who scored the first points of the game and the last points of the game, two free throws to win it for Utah. That's unbelievable. So that's where we stand with sports. Also, one other, oh, other big thing. College football conferences are putting out conference-only schedules. And unfortunately, with the SEC, to non-conference games, that means we don't have Florida, Florida State this year. And that sucks. I understand it, but it still sucks. Are these conference, and the SEC is postponing games to what would normally be week four, September 26th. Other conferences, the Big 12 we haven't heard from, but what are they going to do, something different? I think not. And there's another issue, and it's a dramatic one. And I don't really have the time to get into it today. What's happened is, and particularly in the SEC, who loves to pay out seven-figure sums for schools to come on down and get their beating while the SEC school wins 63-7. to seven. Those games are gone. What happens to those monies? Do they get paid or do they not get paid? What do the contracts look like? It's all different. Every contract is it's not a uniform thing. That's going to be a fascinating fight to watch because these schools need that money desperately. I mean, Auburn pays over a million dollars. Alabama pays over a million dollars. A lot of other schools pay in the high six figures for these games that they, you know, they fatten their win totals. They send their fans home happy. 
uh, and everybody goes away happy. What's the Billy Joel line? Rub a neck and write it. Rub my neck and write him a check, and I go their merry way. Or they go their merry ways. Same thing. So that's going to be a war to see what's going on. And you know who passed away? Does the name Harvey Updike mean anything to you? In the state of Alabama, it sure as hell does. That's the guy who poisoned the famous Auburn trees. He's an Alabama fan. He was so mad about a Cam Newton jersey being placed on the Bear Bryant statue in Tuscaloosa. And those campuses aren't that far apart. That he poisoned the famous Auburn oaks that they used to TP. And he poisoned them, poisoned them. He made sure they, there was no way to save them. He got in huge trouble, as he should have. Ended up doing time. Was hit with some... Uh, fine so big he could never pay it back well he just passed away at age 71 so that's a little bit of college football news for you all right i think we're going to have a broadcasting miracle today i mentioned i, I, I wanted a guest i wanted somebody who's had an impact in south florida in the community i wanted somebody who is a true pro somebody who knows the area somebody who i admire somebody who's had a distinguished career and really a genuine impact. Paul Castronovo couldn't make it. So I got, <laughs> I had to do that. Here she is, folks. Yes, I'm going to make it official by putting this banner up and I'm going to put this up. Kelly Craig is here. We did it. Yay. Hi, Dave. How are you? Hey, how are you? I'm okay. Now, you're still in the Southland. Shutters up. What's your story? <laughs> of course there's a hurricane. It's 2020. I mean, God. But it looks like, at this point anyway, uh, the South Florida area, at least the majority of it anyway, seems to be out of the cone. And let's keep praying that it skews farther east the more and more we look at this daggone thing. I'm telling you, could you have ever, Dave, imagined where we out a year ago? No, not in any way, not in anything in, in your personal life, not in anything in um, broadcasting, none of it, none of it. Yeah, I, I was in Washington, D.C. when the crap hit the fan. And the funny thing is, I was with the student group. We had gone to an NBA game the night before the Rudy Gobert incident. We had been traveling on, you know, metro trains and we were at a convention and um, man, it plug was pulled three hours later we're at the airport trying to get everybody back home to their parents and that I was know. It, you know it's so sad and um somebody said the other day running errands is new going out isn't it mm -hmm. the truth it's back on truth you know i get to be going to the grocery store going to cvs oh you know um it's just crazy. And, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I, I just I'm really concerned about, you know, my friends who uh, are stuck inside and don't have anybody really in their lives to to talk with. Them. You know, I, I, I for all my feeling now that we're into this, what, five, six months now. Yeah. Um, whoops. Uh, that uh, people are really getting to the point where they're, the, the depression is setting in and the sadness, and um, they, they want to wow. We want some hope. It's unfortunate that, you know, we're not living in a political climate where there is a lot of hope. You know, instead <laughs> there's just all the vitriol and yeah. forth, and it's really sad. You know, it would be really, really nice if we if we had a little bit of hope here. And um, I guess I'm thinking, please, dear God, let this vaccine come uh, as soon as it possibly can, right? Well, we're going to need that. And then, of course, that'll bring in a, a, a crowd of folks who don't believe in vaccines, and we'll have that debate to deal with. The thing that I miss, and I know when you were at, in your career, I, you you started at a time when there was civility in politics. It was, not always, mind you, but there was civility. And that's the one thing that I miss more than anything else. Disagreements are fine. That's normal. But it's civility is what I'm worried about. It's the, lo the loss of it. I'm worried if that'll ever come back. Do you get it back after it's been so deteriorated? I'm not certain that you do. Um, but certainly, almost like the floodgates have been open. Anybody can say whatever they want to. And um, there, there's just sort of um, a lack of shame. You know, what people do. <laughs> That's good. Lack of shame. Am I right? How, 
All right. Again, we were, you know, very, much of our careers were, were spent without social media, critiquing everything that's been said and critiquing everything that's been done within seconds. And I think that's where a lot of the lack of shame and lack of civility went out the window. Right. And everything. So in four, when you wanted to broadcast something, maybe you'd get on the phone with a couple of people. That was our idea of broadcasting with um you know media the way it is and everybody has a platform and everybody's right and everybody else is wrong so shut up about it it's, <laughs> it's just um it can be very overwhelming and so to take things in doses i think is probably the best idea that we all can do because you can also look at, you know what i used to do the news business look at the 24-hour cycle there is now um and certainly when i got into the business it wasn't as blatant um, people tend to watch uh, a network that fortifies their own ideals. And uh, used to be yeah. that there was this idea of uh, balance and um, right. to be unbiased. Um, but that's not what it is. And I think, you know, uh, one particular network started it and, uh, and um, everybody just, and, and it's also the way on social media. People tend oh, yeah. to. to Get up on their bully and, and you know what do you intend by you really tend to change minds because that's not going to happen that's not going to happen but you can fortify your own point of view and i guess that's what people are doing so there's no doubt about it you go to where What's you go going? where you yeah let me uh do the Okay, if you can hear me, Dave, I can no longer hear you. Now, I can read lips. So really over-articulate so I can understand what you are saying. No, nope. I, I fixed it. Now it should be back. It should be okay now. You think it's going to be okay now? Okay. All right. Yeah, you so got what it. What else has happened with you, Dave? Are you still doing the bowl? Uh, not this year. I had some chances early and couldn't do it. And now there's been even that sport, which you could, you really, I think, could implement social distancing, but they have, there's been nothing there for me anyway. And there's just been scattered events. They're hoping to have their big team event in September in Maine. The other problem we're having, they're having, is a lot of bowlers are international and some of them have just not come to the United States because they can't. The best bowler in the world lives in Australia. Haven't seen him on this coast in months. So you can't have fans in the stands, so you lose the atmosphere of that, as, as we are seeing with the other sports. Although I didn't – you know what? I don't know if you watched any of the game last night, basketball. Those fake fans weren't that bad to me. Well, maybe in bowling we could put the cardboard uh, fans in the stands. That would be cool. <laughs> that I would like to see. Oh, it's it's – that's the other thing that's so weird. You talked about getting back to what this year has been like. What we do try to do and to compensate, pumping in fake noise, putting in pseudo fans, uh, you know, empty buildings. I get it. And it's, we're doing the best we can. And I think the NBA and, and the NHL are in a great spot because they bubbled, whereas these major league baseball couldn't, couldn't work that out. And I don't know how football's going to work out. I have no clue. No clue how they're going to pull this off. Mm -hmm. Well, again, this is the, the, the surreal part of 2020. It, it is so surreal. They're very um, fascinating. But in any case, we move on and, um, you know, we've adapted. That's another thing. I'm really uh, proud of how we're adapting, particularly um, teachers. I mean, you look at what they mm -hmm. did uh, so quickly by turning last school year around to be able to um, completely graduate these kids via online. And I that was maybe in five weeks. You know, that, that's tough. And now they've got to turn around and where you are. They have a whole different set of circumstances uh, going into the coming school year. So in my mind, they are our heroes. They are our frontline heroes in my opinion. You know, I did, uh, the last two years, I've read the names of graduation over at American Heritage and Plantation where I do some part-time teaching. And of course, la last year, 
you're facing the auditorium, which by the way, Kelly, I don't know if you've ever done that. And I know you're, you know, you've dealt with high pressure situations and reading important stories and going out on the field. That was the most nerve wracking maybe moment of my career was doing graduation names, 300 and plus in front of people. Because we're not used to having an immediate audience, right? Nerve wracking. This year, I had to go sit in a room and read them. And then any ones that were made that were wrong, I had to correct them, which thankfully weren't that many. And I have to say the school and a lot of schools did this, did a virtual graduation and did a wonderful job with it. And I did feel bad for these boys and girls who didn't get that walk, didn't get that handshake, didn't get that that feeling of getting that diploma in, in a hand and have that moment where there's 2000 people looking at you and you get to make that walk of, you know, symbolically walking into the next phase of your life. That stunk. But I would say they did the, I think you're right. The schools and the instructors did the absolute best they could, especially early because we were just, you know, we were punch drunk for about a month with this, right? Yeah, it, it was tough, and uh, for you, I would imagine, because it's one of the most important moments in the child's life thus far, and their parents are watching and everything else. So my hat's off to you, Mr. Lamont. That probably was not easy. i tell you, um, when I did work for the village of Palmetto Bay, uh, things we did was um, a virtual parade for these kids, and we had every uh, senior in the village, this would be 12th grade, who was graduating, put their name in, and we put their name on a list. We put together a parade, including the mayor, all the council people. We had an ambulance, fire truck, you name it. And every graduating senior went on this list, and they got a visit from us. And I mean, nice. we went down the street, sirens blaring. And it was so heartwarming because, you know, they missed out on so much. But we, um, yeah. we also had coverage from CBS4. I was excited about that. And some of them did out on their front lawns with their graduating robes on and signs and everything else they missed out on all of those rites of passage you know the graduation the prom all of those things. so this has been a hard for a lot of people but what you try to do is is make the aid out of the lemons and um my hats off to uh, our mayor for thinking that up she's an amazing woman and uh pulled that all together and as i said for over 100 years and it took us hours, but we we did it, and um, it was exciting. It was fun. And oh, that's it, fantastic! It really, kind of. Yeah. Well, um, the so, can, can I that? just offer? I keep hearing these words. Of but I do. Can I make a suggestion though to the moms and dads out there? And I don't know about your neighborhood because you live south. I'm in Broward. It's time to take the congratulations graduate signs off the lawns. It's time. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Well, again, Dave, I'm having. I, I, I don't know if, if everybody's having problems hearing you, but I'm reading your lips and I like it. Okay. When you smile, so that's good. So maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to go. Say uh, thank you for having me on your broke up program. I listen to all the time. I love to see that come up in my feed. But to be on the show today is a real treat. So thank you. Ron. Well, thank you. I apologize if there are any technical issues. At least we got to see you this time. And I know we're having a couple of technical problems, and I'm very, very sorry about that. I wanted a clean show, but I can't thank Kelly enough. And what I wanted to say to her and um, was that she had a lot to do with me doing this in the first place. Uh, I, when I put this on Facebook, a lot of you responded positively that I should go out and take a shot at it. And one of the people who said I should do it was her. Now, you know Kelly's background. And if you're from out of state and you're watching, you don't know. Kelly had a long, very distinguished career in journalism, media journal, broadcast journalism, I should say, and reported on everything from Hurricane Andrew to all of the drama that living in this area, South Florida, entails and was wonderful, absolutely wonderful at it. And uh, to hear from a, a real professional, uh, that meant a lot to me. So uh, I, you know, I do give her credit. But that might have been the final, you know, boot in the butt to to get me to do this. It's not difficult to do this, by the way, but 
you know, you're always a little uncertain to take on a venture like this because you don't know who's going to be watching and you don't know if anyone's going to pay any darn attention to you. So I will admit that trying this led to some audio issues in the little earphones I had. So if there were some audio issues today, I am extremely sorry for that. Uh, I am the least technical person on the planet Earth. The gentleman um, from the Sports Objective podcast who dreamed up this and this that you're looking at, that I'm pointing at, these overlays they're called, this is how untechnical and un, you know sophisticated I am with this stuff. He emailed me and said, hey, I can do some overlays for you. I didn't know what he meant. He had the he downloaded them thankfully. I do know how to open a download. And I go, oh, that's what an overlay is. And that's what you see there for that and also for the almost daily Dave. So any technical issues certainly are my responsibility, but uh, hopefully you got uh, some enjoyment out of hearing and seeing Kelly. And again, a thousand thanks to her. And hopefully uh, future guests will uh, have a little bit less in the uh, technical snafu department, if there were any at all. But she said she was having a hard time hearing me. And what was going on in my end was almost like if you've ever watched cable news and, or news, doesn't matter if it's cable, and you have the anchor sitting there, he or she is sitting there, and then the reporter is in the field, and they're in maybe a different country. And there's that long delay, even with modern technology and all the satellites that have been shot up in the air to help get things to us, there's still that delay. So the reporter has to stand there. The anchor says their piece, and the reporter does this. Well, and then you have that same awkward exchange. So that's that was happening on my end. And again, um, we'll work on that. I'll, I'll yell at the StreamYard people a little bit for that. So I for, was going to ask Kelly about fixing the English language uh, because I've got to believe that she has several issues with the English language. So I didn't get a chance to do that today. And I'll be honest, I didn't prepare anything about it. Um, I'm not going to worry about any kind of English language lectures today, but I'll just want to go back if you're just sitting down and just repeat a couple of things. Uh, we we don't have a St. Louis Cardinals Milwaukee Brewers game tonight because the Cardinals have a, at least one positive COVID-19 test. So that sidelines six major league baseball teams. College football is starting to release conference only schedules and changing dates. But is it still going to be enough? And it's such a weird thing because, again, I always use the University of Wyoming as a bellwether for us because that's where one of our sons is. And they're sitting up there in, in Laramie with this many positive tests, kids. Zippo. 45 minutes to the south, Colorado State, who's in their conference in Fort Collins, Colorado, just had 17. Now, Fort Collins, I believe, has a bigger population, and you're not far from Denver, and you're not far from Boulder. So maybe that has something to do with it. Maybe people there are more careless. I don't know what the hell's going on. And that's the thing about this virus that is so irritating. It just does what it wants to do. It almost is as if it does have a mind, and the mind is evil. So I share the optimism of some who thinks that we'll eventually be able to beat this thing back into a corner in, in where it came from, and we'll win, and we'll go back and have 2021 and be cool and positive again. All right, Kelly, show what you, uh, hang on here. All right, wait. It says, uh, all right, um, you're back. Do you want to be back? <laughs> yeah, I want to be back. <laughs> now I can actually hear you. Now Thank I God. Can hear you. Oh, I know why I can't hear you. That's why. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good. Dave, so listen, uh, I am delighted to be on your show and you're doing great. And um, so, but what else is going on with you personally? You know, every once in a while, when I go through your feeds, I see you have all these kids. Catch me up. <laughs> I know you have all these kids, but but they're into sports big time. They're yeah. they're really good, good athletes. And I know you don't like to brag, but but tell us about it. Tell us about your family. Well, all right. So I just, uh, just while you were coming back in, I mentioned my youngest son, Drew, is at Wyoming on a basketball scholarship and has two years there. So naturally we're concerned about any effect that this may have on college basketball and delaying the start of the season. I think they're going to play, but it may not play till January, but that's okay. At least they'll play. Uh, our foster son, TJ Slater to Daryl Slayton, as everybody knows him is a nose guard at university of Florida, who's now appearing on lists for the NFL draft. 
Ooh, how exciting. Oh, by the way, that delay is gone. That little, that little, I was just telling this story about the delay where, you know, you're in the field and I'm in the, and you're standing there waiting to hear my question, that kind of thing yeah. you, you dealt with. Yeah. And we had that going. So that's gone. And, um, and so far they're powering through at Florida and my oldest Drake, um, has just got into grad school at Texas tech for sports management. And he will be a graduate is actually a graduate assistant on the Texas tech basketball team with a goal of getting into coaching. Wow. Your wife had so much testosterone in that house mm -hmm. to deal with. Oh my God. Yeah. You had to I mean, girl, even things out. Do you have any girl pets maybe? A female dog. Interestingly, our two, our two, the golden retrievers we've had have one we have now and one we did have have both been female. There you go. Yeah, you I have four legged daughters. daughters. <laughs> well, you remember, Kelly, I know you met my wife before. She was an athlete too. I really was the only non athlete in the family. I am the only non athlete. I was always the announcer. Well, that's you're part of you are ensconced in the athletic world. <laughs> Listen, yeah. I grew up the same way. I, I don't know where I came from. I always have told my mother I was the mailman's baby, right? Because I have two brothers who were, <laughs> you never know, my mother. Well, listen. Yeah, uh, you know. <laughs> but I have, um, no, no, no. I have uh, two brothers who are the most gifted natural athletes. And when I say natural, it's like they could pick up anything and do it well. And I always hated them yeah. for it. Uh, but, um, yeah. And the, my one brother was in the world of, uh, athletics, college athletics for a very long time. And, uh, my younger brother is just one of these kids that was playing varsity, uh, baseball, you know, and he was 14, 15 years old. So, um, I enjoy sports, Dave, you know, I actually just bought a place on the 17th fairway. I don't play golf. So I'm a That's good, okay. observer. I'm a good observer of sport. <sighs> I'm about to play when I sign off here, and it will be a day of grave hap great happiness and grave frustration. Uh, oh, you're so playing ball. It, Yeah, there's a place over here. Hopefully, I think the weather's going to hold up uh, because it's Friday, and uh, so I, I have to keep remembering that because I don't know about you, but the days of the week sometimes are like this. They're, they're, it's all like one long day. And living in Florida where the weather's all the same, I don't know about you, but I get mixed up on the months. I get mixed up on the seasons. It's crazy. It really yeah. is. Yeah. So, it's, you know, I was wondering, Dave, when, when is the last time that we ever saw each other personally? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm, I'm fearing that it might have been back at the big 105.9 studios. I think it was. I think it was. Uh, with, and that, at that time, it was Paul and young Ron. Right. Steve Harmon was producing. You and I were on, you were on almost every day, and I was in there at least one day a week. And uh, actually, we had a lot of laughs doing that. And I haven't been in those studios now in over a year since they changed management, and, and Paul's show was tweaked around a little bit. Of course, Ron left a few right. years ago, which, you know, I've said before, he, it was time for him to retire. He had done every, everything he wanted to do. Uh, let me ask you this question. Go ahead. Because when, when people know you're on the show. I got a lot of questions, not about Paul, because Paul's an open book. But I got right. questions about Ron. So what would, would people ask you about Ron? What would you say? Uh, he's the enigma wrapped up in a riddle, wrapped up in a everything. He, um, <laughs> one of the, the funniest, organically funny people I have ever met. Um, he was so intelligent. I mean, mm -hmm. you could bring up almost anything, and uh, he would have not only something to say about it, but something very witty to say. Um, and he was willing to go there on the air with Paul. I mean, the weirder, the better. And he knew he knew his lane, and uh, I just adored him. Uh, I really did. And we, he, I'm from Baltimore. He worked in Baltimore, so we had that uh, kind of background together. But. Um, you know, there was a lot of work that goes into that show. People say, you must have had a, a million laughs, and we did. But what people don't realize is what comes off as um, spontaneous really takes a lot of work to look spontaneous. And uh, in fact, one day I had a guest in the, the studio, and they were shocked at how much work goes on and how much frenetic energy is uh, there be between um, actually being on the air and the commercials. At that time, the commercials were like, what, seven to nine minutes? Yes. And all of that time was spent 
uh, preparing for the next segment. And um, it was, uh, and it was sometimes very quiet in the studio because Ron was always getting his news together and, and Paul was always thinking about the next bit. So um, a lot of work went into that show. And I, I have to say, one of the funniest memories was Paul decided to take a day off or uh, was down the hall or something. And Ron was like, oh, so who's going to be? <laughs> Remember that? Who was going to be the host? And uh, you were there and I was there and it was just the three of us. And I'm, I'm looking around like, what are we going to do? My eyes are like saucers. This was in the commercial getting ready to go on the air. And I remember you said, let's see how fast we can crash this thing into the side of a building. <laughs> <laughs> and probably it happened rapidly. It you was know, it was, horrible. It well, was Well, part so of it horrible. is the, people have to understand the layout. There would be the three of us side by side. And across the way, Paul would run the control board. So he right. would be the way he had, he had all the buttons. Well, I know how to run a control board, but I didn't know how to run that board because I didn't know what was what. And also there were computers involved. It's not like the old days. There were, so I wouldn't have known how to bring the show back. And I would no. just have to wait. You know, I think finally we, I think we blurted out something and then Paul finally came in. He probably was recording a commercial or something, but yeah, yeah the thing, I would always tell people this about Ron. I would say some of what you hear from Ron or about Ron is true. Some of it is show, but I'm not going to tell you which. You're going to have to guess. And I guarantee if they guessed, they would get it wrong. Right. You're absolutely right. But I can tell you, um, because this is what it all boils down to in life, he was a very kind person and a very giving person, but just the funniest man. And the two of them together... I'm sorry, that was magic. And I know a lot of people, I know a lot of people missed them terribly together. And I do too. And I really missed working with them. It was a treat. It really was. Yeah, I miss being down there and hanging out with everybody. But the show has, has bounced back after a little bit of a tough stretch. And Paul and, and Toast and Heather are doing very well. Mike Anderson, their producer now, is doing very well. So I'm happy for them. You Me know, it's too. interesting. I think the one person who doesn't miss it is Ron. Uh, to be blunt about it, but you're, and by the way, he didn't, he's not dead. When Kelly said was kind, he probably still is kind. Ron, as far as we know, is still with us. Okay. So let's, let's straighten go. that out. It's all good. The thing I remember also about him is that, you know, and you saw how many famous comics came in that room or comics who were on their way up that were playing at improvs or playing theaters. I mean, really well-known, funny people. And Ron sometimes was not only funnier than them, but had better timing than they did. Oh, and yeah. that always blew me away. His ability to sense when it was the right time to jump in with something funny or outrageous was uncanny. And that is a gift. And that is knowing your partner, of course, and knowing your, you, know, you mentioned knowing the lane. That was my favorite thing about Ron was uncanny comic timing. Mm-hmm. The two of them, Paul and Ron, they both had it. And they were every bit as funny as the comics. That's why the comics like to come in there. Yes, because they, they were could challenged. Play. You know, they yep. weren't the typical, you know, the radio hosts. I mean, they were indeed uh, comics themselves. And um, it was great. But I, but as you said, I do enjoy still listening to Paul and the gang now. And, uh, yeah, it is different. And it has changed, as everything must, as we move on. Uh, but, yeah, I still do enjoy that very, very much. Absolutely. Speaking of moving on, you recently left a job you had for about two and a half years. Uh, do you have something lined up? you have something in mind? Or are you just kicking back? I'm kicking back for now because it's been a rough – the past three years have been hellish for me. And uh, so I'm really happy to just kind of light for a while and, and see what comes my way. There have been some interesting propositions floating out there. And who know. knows, maybe yeah. something, <laughs> no, that <laughs> has not happened in years. It's been a okay. long time okay. since we've okay. made I'm just saying. No um, need to share that. Well, you know, there is this platform. No, um, I'm perfectly, <laughs> no. Personally, I am so blessed to have family and friends who mm -hmm. I love dearly, and that's perfectly fine by me. I'm so happy, and... Um, We'll see what comes along. There have been some interesting things, but I'm not quite sure if that's my bag. So I'm just waiting. 
and um, enjoying going to the beach every day and just uh, oh, cool. and just hanging. Yeah, as I said, I moved into a new place, so I'm getting that ready. In fact, I'm having a chair delivered in just a second. It's a big deal. <laughs> and you're decorating. I'm a woman. This is what this is, lady. If you're watching, this is the chair. This is the chair that's going to make my place. Women, mm -hmm. we all think we're interior decorators. We mm -hmm. all think that we have the best place. This is our thing. Dave, let me have this. Please let me have this. I have I have so little in life now. It's all you. It's all yeah. you. I actually, listen, I now have been sucked into watching some of these uh, tear down, bring back the life shows that are 100% yes. on HGTV. The whole roster of HGTV now is some couple, either married or not married, or in case of the one, the folks from Indianapolis, a mom and daughter, whom I like, by right. the way, the good bones. I like them. Yeah. Um, I, I, I now admit that I get sucked into some of these. I watch Love It or List It. Oh, I love um, that show. So do Listen, I. Every man would never admit it, but everybody loves that show. And I can, I can tell you a couple secrets. Shoot. Being in the biz. Because um, people say, I hate it when the people go into the house that they are uh, considering buying and they articulate every little thought and this isn't right in that. Listen, the producers tell oh. them, please tell us what you're thinking. We know that that isn't normal, but the producers say, let's go in there. And then the fake conflict. I love every mm -hmm. show the fake conflict. Like, oh, that beam has to be torn down because that's a load bearing wall. <laughs> if there were no conflict, gang, there wouldn't be a show. So just right. know that they, right. do, they do all these inspections beforehand and they know what the problems are going to be. So don't feel too bad for these people. And know in the, in the end, everything's going to work out. Um, but yeah, uh, I think it all started with trading spaces and then over the years, TLC and Bravo and so forth, they've all got these uh, shows that really suck you in and then you get invested in the people. Mm -hmm. the producers of it, I have a friend who um, produces the HGTV Dream House, that, that's her show. Um, and you know, there's always a backstory with the people. Um, but what you don't see, and, and don't feel bad about this when you're fixing up your house and it doesn't come along as quickly as it does on television, there are so many producers and decorators that you don't see. Who you see on the screen is maybe one-fifth of the amount of people no, working on the show. So just know that there's a lot more that goes on behind the scenes. The permits alone, you know, that doesn't make for good TV, Expect to go through all that if you're going to fix up your own house. It is not a documentary, gang. I can tell you that right now. But at the same time, watching these shows is so entertaining, as you said, mm -hmm. Dave. And, um, you know, you do get some great ideas for your own house, especially when you're stuck at home. See, this, this is one of my biggest problems as a person. Not as a person. It's just my brain. I can't visualize in my brain. You have to actually show it to me. That's why some of the stuff that I see that, that these folks come up with for ideas, I cannot think that way. You have to slam it, the idea in my face and let me see it. Then I can go whether I like it or not. I just don't have that. My brain does not function in that way. Well, what's interesting now is because of technology, all you can, uh, these designers, I, I just had some work done in my place. And the designer said, here's what I'm talking about. And she just put it on the computer so quickly. It was like, wow, that's exactly what I want. And um, for people like you, and I can I can visualize to a degree, but in my mind, it has to be exactly the way I want it. So I need to see it. Um, but but for people like us, thank God for technology. I mean, if you can think about it and you have somebody there on the iPad who can do it, and they do, you know, yeah, and it's big uh, business. Um, I was talking to these designers the other day and they said business is booming because people are at home, they're watching mm -hmm. these shows and they're looking around thinking, what can we do to our place? They know they don't have to go out for it. So they, they sub the work in. I was at a, a, a silly fabric store the other day. I'm telling you, there were women in there wall to wall buying fabric. Well, fabric is sold out. In the beginning of all this, when people were home making masks, we have some friends oh. we visit periodically when we're walking our dog and they they would go to I think it's Joanne Fabrics, and they had lines out the, you know, it looked like oh, a soup no. kitchen from the from the Great Depression, and they are they can't find any uh, fabric. And now I think it's the Great Fabric shortage. Yes, please explain <laughs> this because this was on your Facebook page yesterday. Yes, a um, teacher friend of mine um, came up with an idea this summer, and I can't put it on now because I'm holding the um, 
Wait a minute. Oh, Where okay. Here we go. okay. I'm holding this alone, but anyway, you put this on and it's got this little flap so that if you're out social distancing and um, mm -hmm. maybe you're at a neighbor's house or something in the backyard, you open the flap and see, you can put a, um, a straw up to your mouth or you can eat through it. And I thought it was great. It's called the sip and snack mask. Dot nice, com. Nice. And um, I mean, you talk about being enterprising. She had a few weeks uh, on her hands and uh, before she had to go back to school or not um, this this September uh, or August. And she thought, why don't we get together and do this? So they they sew them right here in the U.S. Nothing is shipped overseas. And I just thought that is an enterprising young lady. So, yeah, I went on my Facebook page and I helped promote it. I really hope it takes off. It's called Sip and the letter N Snack Mask. Two there's one question I really wanted to ask you, and it's a professional question. And then I, I, I have this segment. I close it out uh, by at, trying to correct the English language. I'm guessing you probably have a few uh, oh, ideas on that. I, the one question I did want to ask from a professional point of view, was there a moment in your career you're sitting at the desk and you're, and you're, and you're describing a story, you're telling a story, and you're in the back of your brain going, man, I can't believe I'm doing this. I can't believe this story. You know, it could have been something heavy and dramatic like Andrew. It could have been something funny or weird. But I'm wondering, you know, because it's almost like a pinch me moment, either in a bad way or in a good way. Well, it was actually um, not on the anchor desk. It was a story that I did as a reporter um, when I was working in San Antonio, Texas. I was maybe 24 years old. And Dave, I had gone to the... Um, I think it was Brook Army Medical Center there. San I've Antonio. Been there. Okay, so you know, San Antonio mm -hmm. is full of, of um, army bases and um, all sorts of military bases there. It's a big military town. And on this one particular occasion, it was late at night. I'm trying to remember if it was, um, there were some military bases that were bombed in Beirut or whether it was Grenada. I'm not quite sure what the occasion was, but long story short, they brought the men who were injured to Brook Army Medical Center very late at night uh, because it was the premier uh, burn facility in the United States. So they, sh they shipped these men in and I was covering it that night. And when I say men, I was, I, I don't know why, but in my mind, I was picturing much older men because even though the, um, the stretchers were taken in very quickly, I was able to see a couple of their faces and they were so much younger than I ever imagined they would be. And my heart was breaking, but um, we reported on that. And so that was that one night, but I, I say that as, as a sort of background to the, oh my gosh, what a great story moment. I wanna say it was like nine or 10 months, Dave, after those men were brought in, I did a follow-up story. One of the um, newspapers in town did a, a retrospective, a, a profile, on some of these men that were still being treated there months later. And they were there by themselves. They didn't have family there. They you know, were from all over the country. Maybe their families visited them in the beginning, but their, their um, recovery was going to take months. So months later, the newspapers did a story on some of these men and a profile and um, kind of went into their backgrounds. And there was a young lady who read about these gentlemen and out of the goodness of her heart, she called the hospital and said, you know, these guys are there alone, can I visit them? And she would go and take them cookies or just go in there and sit. Well, she struck up a really good friendship with one of the gentlemen and um, the friendship blossomed into something else. And um, unfortunately he lost both of his legs in the conflict, whatever it was, I'm trying to remember. And God, I, I even think that he, it might have been through friendly fire. So he had a long recovery ahead of him. But my story was they got engaged, Dave. Nice, and, nice. and I got to go to Brook Army Medical Center. There was a, cha a, a little chapel on the, uh, the campus there. And they got married. And I was able to cover their wedding. And he walked on artificial legs for the first time so that he could walk his bride back down the aisle. Awesome. Yeah, I have been there, and I went there for the All-American All football game. I had done some voiceover work for the game, and they invited me to San Antonio. So we spent a few hours there. And it, what it is, and it actually, for as difficult as it is to see the suffering that, that these men and women have gone through, on the other hand, I left encouraged because there was so much effort that goes into And you mentioned artificial limbs. That is like the capital. Of, of the prosthesis that are being built for the soldiers 
and the recovery and the effort and the energy and the rehab rooms and all of that, they're, they're getting unbelievable care. I mean, if you're wondering about that, and, and you should look into it, it's called BAMC, B-A-M-C, or Brooks Army Medical Center. You should look at it uh, for, for folks who have a moment who don't know about it, because it's strange. You usually, I actually walked out of there feeling all right, as opposed to thinking, oh God, this is going to be brutal. And at time, yeah, it is. But at the same time, I felt that we were doing something right for people who really need something right. I mean, things as simple as uh, a cutout automobile to learn how to open a car door again or get in and out of a car. They could practice something that we take for granted every day, just about. Uh, and all of that kind of thing that, that, that these uh, soldiers could do with these devastating injuries. So that was that was pretty cool. That's an awesome story. Well, you know, it was amazing because um, at that time, when you would do an interesting story, you would upload it to the network and then they would either they would send it out to all their affiliates. And I heard from people all over the country because that story got picked up. I Don't tell me that people don't like a feel good story. They do. They do. And, yeah. and that was a great, and I wish I could follow up. I wonder, I wonder about them. You know, I wonder if, if they have children. I wonder if they have grandchildren at this point, because if I'm 23, they were probably about the same age. So now they're probably 48. Yeah, <laughs> I, I would think. They don't have grandchildren. They've only, that was 10 years ago. Come on, give me a break. Yeah, right. right. But anyway, um, what I about actually you? Have to, well, I actually have to leave. Before. Well, I, you know what? I'm, you're right. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I do have to go in a couple of minutes if I'm going to make my tea time. And I've already paid, so I got to go. But um, for me, and I thought about this because I knew I was going to ask you this question. I think the, the one that hit me was... Um, the first bowl game I ever called. And it's weird that that's the first thing that popped into my head because I had done some college football, but not bowl games. And bowl games are kind of like the dog bone at the end of the year. You've been a good boy. Here's a bowl game. And uh, we were in uh, downtown Detroit. Um, I can't remember. I think Central Michigan was one of the teams, and I can't think of the name of the other one. And I remember uh, Ray Bentley was my analyst, my dear friend. And the, uh, the producer said, okay, you know, let's get ready. And I put my jacket on and I turned to my friend who was my spotter. I said, God, I love this job. And that's when it really hit me that I was going to do a bowl game. And it was a small bowl game. It, and it, I didn't care. I didn't care. And it's funny because I've been at College World Series when the Hurricanes won and I've been a lot of cool events. But when I thought about what you might say and you didn't give me an answer I expected, which was really nice. This was the one moment that flashed into my brain first, strangely enough. It was a minor bowl game in, in downtown Detroit. Oh, well, that's, you know what it is, Dave? I think it's, um, we realized that we had a dream, you know, to do a particular job and we're, when we got to do it. And uh, I still feel like the best is yet to come. And, uh, and I, and I right. hope that for you as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Kelly, I do want um, to, uh, first off, thanks for coming back. <laughs> things welcome. sound a lot better and I, I and I don't know if you heard but I mentioned earlier and I want to make sure you heard it that you probably more than anyone who wrote back to me on Facebook was responsible for me doing this in the first place because it's oh. you you're a pro you're Kelly Craig you're not just somebody you're you know you you were I mean I watched you for years and I always thought you were fantastic and the fact that you can crack a crab leg with a uh, a hammer as fast as probably anybody being a, a bomber girl from Charm yeah, City. Man. <laughs> and no, but that meant a lot to me. It really did. And I'm being completely serious. So I want to thank you for that, for, for thinking that I'd be good enough You're to make great. it even moderately interesting. You're um, a well, thank you. All right. Help me pick out something that, about the English language that people are not getting right. The words a lot are two words. <laughs> yes. And same Why with all right, think? right? Why do people think a lot is one word? No, it drives me insane. What about all right? I see it now spelled as one word. Is, isn't it two? Isn't it well, A-L-L, -L, right? It can be A-L-R-I-G-H-T. Yes, sir, it can be. Really? Yes, sir, Dave, it is. Okay, mm -hmm. I surrender. I'm once again proven wrong. But a lot, yes, I know. That's lazy. Uh, can I do one more? Yeah, go ahead. Have you ever, Kelly, let's say you, you go to a, a, a purse or to a, a suitcase, something, have you ever loosed something or did you lose it? 
I hear that too. I hear that I too. Have, I have loosened a tie. I have loosened my shoelaces. You have a phone call. It's probably your shoe delivery, your shoe delivery, your chair uh -huh. delivery. Uh -huh. But I have never loosed anything in my life, nor have I seen a team loosing a game. I've seen them lose a game, but not loose a game. I know. I know. Well, um, people need to proofread. That's all. They get excited. They want to post. So we just need to take a minute, read our stuff, and then know your names on that. Your names on that, folks. But in any case, and Dave, thanks for having me. Kelly, thank you. We will fix the lack of uh, personal communication once we get vaccinated, yeah. and uh, it would be delightful <laughs> to see you. Thank you so much again, particularly for, for bouncing back in and for being my first guest. My pleasure, and good luck, Dave. Keep it thank going. Thank you watching. Thank you. That's Kelly Craig, everybody. I'm Dave Lamont. I really do have a tea time to go catch this. This was a long episode, and it should have been. As, as I fully expected, Kelly was just awesome. So I'll put this up on YouTube probably later on tonight. Please subscribe, and I uh, hope you enjoyed this nooner. Uh, any technical issues, I apologize for, but I think that last half hour came through pretty clearly. Have a wonderful weekend. I'll see you Monday at 12 o'clock Central Florida time. Stay safe. See you soon.